Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Jagate Khan. Power and speed be hands and feet. Conquering the world on horseback is easy, it is dismounting and governing that is hard. I heard from a contact on Mars, Jagate, that you do strange things to your ships. The Khan shot him a heavy lidded stare. I heard that you do strange things to your warriors. I believe in speed. Power. Power and speed solve many things. Jagate Khan, how would be his name, otherwise known as the Great Khan, the Warhawk of Chagoris. The master of the ice blue heavens or the Kagan is the missing primarch of the white scars space marines legion chapter, whose name nobody in BL audiobooks can pronounce, Protip, Chu Tai Han. He went missing with the entire first brotherhood of the white scars while chasing after a cabal of dark elder near the warp rift called the maelstrom. Being named after a barbarian warlord, one would assume he would be nothing but a brute, but Jagate was quite the complex man. He loved leading the charge on his custom Sajutsu pattern void bike, which could actually fly through deep space, but also enjoyed reading the literature and lore of the planets conquered during the Great Crusade. His love for the hunt was tempered by strict discipline and personal morals. Based on how he approached his duties, he was a free spirit who didn't want to be chained down to a throne or an emperor, but also, paradoxically, a far-sighted leader who believed in unity and duty beyond freedom as an end in itself. He even supported careful use of the warp, leading to an odd, yet strong, friendship with his brother Magnus. Contrary to popular belief, he is not named after Genghis Khan, but his second son Chagate, who was known for his hot-headed attitude. Upon the death of Genghis Khan, he inherited the territory that is now the countries of Turkmenistan, Tajikistan. Kyrgyzstan in southern Uzbekistan, southern Kazakhstan, western China, India, Afghanistan and Pakistan. And this was one of the smallest Khanates. It should also be noted that the name in the original Mongol is Tsagadehan, with the more commonly known spelling given to the character deriving from the Iranian transliteration. Youth. It is said that after being mysteriously transported from Terra through the warp by the ruinous powers of chaos, Khan landed on a planet in the Segmentum Pacificus named Mundus Planus by the Imperium, or as the native population called it, Chagoris. It is a fertile world with wide, open, green plains and tall, white mountains and blue seas. At the time of the Great Crusade, the Chaguran people had managed to restore their technological level to one similar to the pike and shot level of the late Renaissance on ancient Terra. The dominant empire was a well-organized feudal aristocracy which had conquered most of the planet with well-equipped and highly disciplined armies, maintaining armored horsemen and tight blocks of pike and arc with assumed infantry. Their leader was the Palatine, and he won all of his battles with this great army. To the west of the Palatine's empire was the Empty Quarter, a barren grassland with few resources, and as such it was never invaded by the Palatine's armies. It was home to wandering tribes of vicious horsemen who fought each other for their ancestral lands. The Palatine would sometimes lead forces into the empty quarter to capture slaves or merely to hunt the tribesmen for fun. Khan's legacy began here. He was found by Ong Khan, leader of a small tribe called the Talaskas, who saw the young Primarch as a gift from the gods. It is said he had a fire in his eyes, the sign of a great warrior. He was hated by the other tribes because of his ability to see beyond the constant warfare on the steps to a vision of unity for all the downtrodden peoples of the empty quarter. It is said the most influential moment in Jagate's life was the slaying of his adopted father by the rival Kure tribe. Khan, even as a young child, was the greatest warrior of the tribe and gathered Talaska troops to avenge the death of his father. They moved on the Kure tribe and raised it to the ground killing every man, woman and child in a killing frenzy. Khan took the head of the enemy tribe leader and mounted it on his tent. This is what shaped him into a man of fierce honor, loyalty and ruthlessness. From then on, he swore to end the fighting, unite all the people of the steppes and bring an end to their practice of brother fighting brother. Khan fought hundreds of battles against other tribes and defeated hunting packs sent by the Palpatine. 
Each tribe the Talascas conquered was absorbed into the Talasca Confederacy and Jagate made military service mandatory while splitting tribes up and merging them with others to remove and ameliorate tribal differences and long-standing feuds. His warriors were fiercely loyal and Khan promoted from the ranks based on merit and ability. Ten summers after his arrival on the world, as the tribe moved to their winter settlements, the Primarch was traveling on a mountainside with a group of his followers. A vast avalanche pushed him and his group back down the mountain, killing the normal men. Jagate survived, but could not get back up the mountain in time before the tribe moved on. Khan was caught by one of the Palatine's hunting bands, led by the son of that ruler. All that returned of that band was one mutilated rider with the head of the Palatine's son and a note saying that the people of the steppes were no longer his toys. When the snows cleared, the enraged Palpatine gathered a massive army and determined to march west to wipe the tribes from the face of the planet. He had, however, underestimated the power and ability of the Khan and brought his highly disciplined army of heavily armored warriors and Arquebus seers. This proved to be his downfall as they could not catch the lightly armored Talisker tribesmen. The constant rain of arrows from the tribesmen took their toll on the tight ranks of the Palatine's warriors. Eventually the tribesmen defeated the army of the Palatine, who escaped back to his capital with a select few bodyguards. The rest of the army was slaughtered, almost to the last man. After the battle, the tribal elders gathered and announced that Jagate Khan was now Great Khan of the Empty Quarter. Khan now began the long process of conquering the rest of the planet, which possessed only a single continent. He gave those cities he besieged two choices, surrender or be wiped out. Most surrendered, but many were destroyed, utterly wiped from the face of the planet. Eventually they came to the palace of the Palatine, where he demanded the head of the Palatine on a spike. His request was obliged by the capital city's population, which turned on its own ruler to save their own lives from the fierce tribesmen. Jagate Khan adorned his tent with his greatest conquest's head, just as he had with his first enemy two decades before. In only 20 years he had conquered the largest empire in his world's history. He now had the problems of ruling that empire, not something he had originally expected. His nomadic people had no wish to rule these new, settled lands, only to carry on living in their old ways. The Talisker people dispersed back to a tribal existence and Khan ruled over them all with his generals by his side. During this time the Khan revealed his fear to one of his generals. A Sikha shaman who became his closest companion and one of the most important storm seers of the V-Legion. He feared, more than anything, to be trapped in what he called the greatest lie, you are the strongest, there is nobody left to oppose you, and now all you can do now is build bigger walls. Jagate regarded this as the worst fate imaginable for a leader, to grow fat and soft behind sturdy walls to lose his killing edge to a life of comfort and luxury, and he refused to succumb to this lure. Fortunately for him, the Emperor of Mankind arrived on the world as part of the Great Crusade, and the Khan knew at once that this man could fulfill his dream, to unite all of the stars above them and all of humanity in one mighty empire, though the fact that opposition meant destruction and that service was a way off that stupid throne he never wanted might have been factors, too. In front of all of his generals, he dropped to one knee and pledged his service to the Emperor. He was given command of the V Legion of the Space Marines, the Star Hunters, who had been created from his own genetic material. Khan eventually grew close to Lionel Jensen, the Primarch of the Dark Angels, presumably surely bonding over a shared fetish for jet bikes and being mysterious, and his Marines would work in conjunction with the Dark Angels on many occasions. But what about the horse? The fact that Jagate grew up a horseman raises some interesting questions. Namely, Jagate is a Primarch after all, and Primarchs are huge, so. What kind of monster of a horse was bred and raised just to carry Jagate, and why haven't we ever heard of it? We know of Lemon Russ's wolf brothers, so why haven't we heard anything about what we can only assume to be the 30k reincarnation of Koko? We know that the lion and the rest of the Calibnite knights used to ride these giant super horses, so let's just assume Jagate had a similar breed. Chagorian horses are massive, like, carry a Primarch and then some massive. Hawks have a 20 foot wingspan and pick these things up. Great Crusade. Jagate Khan, like so many of his fellow Primarchs, 
shaped his legion into adopting the same strategy as the people of his home world, because GW are firm believers in the planet of hats trope. So the white scars became a legion that favored speed above all and their strategy would usually involve lightning fast mobile assault. As such, the legion was renowned for their skill with the jet bikes that they often used in their campaigns. Jagate was also not content with the usual ships the rest of the legions used, and ordered the Mechanicum to remodel the White Scars ships to be the fastest ships in any of the legions Astartes fleets. The legions Tech Marines further refined these modifications in secret, allowing the legions fleets to maneuver far more effectively than any other ship in human space. This resulted in the only occasion where the Alpha Legion faced off with someone and the encounter ended with Alpharius saying now that I did not expect. As with all of the Primarchs, Jagate would form close, ish, friendships with some of his brothers while avoiding others. Unlike many of the Primarchs, the Khan always felt like an outsider and would keep mostly to himself. Some have suspected he had Asperger's or never learned anything else than his native language presumably because they never spoke to him. Truth is, Jagate came to understand pretty quickly that his legion weren't meant to be central to the crusade the way that the Lunar Wolves, Ultra Smurfs or Imperial Fists were. The White Scars embraced their role as Outriders, perfecting their particular way of fighting and developing a distinctive legion culture. As such, the Khan had few friends amongst his fellow Primarchs, and since he had few friends, the same went for his legion. Amongst the friends he had were Horus and the Lunar Wolves, everyone loved Horus so it would have been more a surprise if he didn't like him, with whom he shared a love of the rapid assault, as well as feeling understood and accepted by Horus. He also counted Magnus the Red and his thousand sons amongst his closest friends. Magnus, like the Khan, had also always felt like an outsider. Mostly due to his nature and the nature of his legion. Both also shared a love for knowledge and the enjoyment in the subtleties of the universe. He also got along well with Sanguinius, since they both believed in the Librarius project. Aside from these three brothers and those he flat out didn't get on with, such as Mortarian, Russ, and Fulgrim, Jagate preferred to campaign way ahead of the Crusade's main frontline, so he barely got to know most of the other Primarchs. Alongside Magnus and Sanguinius, the Khan would form the Librarius, organizing, training, and equipping psychic astarts to use their powers in support of their brothers. It was rumored that the Khan himself also was in possession of psychic powers of some sort. Though the Khan shared a close friendship with Magnus, he would often share his concern that Magnus and his legion was drinking too deep of the chalice of power that the warp offered. Chagora seems to have been one of the only planets where the Sicker shamans practiced moderation well enough to avoid being killed as witches or accidentally turning the place into a demon party. The Khan had always been more in favor of only taking as much as you absolutely needed, to only sip from the cup and never drink it in full, as to do so would be to invite disaster. Magnus and his legion chose to ignore this and kept on chugging as much metaphorical warp juice as they could. If Magnus had listened to Jagate, he would perhaps not have been duped by Tsinch. Or perhaps nothing would have changed, you can never know with Tsinch. As a precaution, the Khan instigated a conversation between the sicker friendly legions, the number of librarians who supported Magnus at Nikia would have been down to him, were it not for Horus dicking around and fixing the results. As the Khan shared a close brotherhood with some of his fellow Primarchs, there were also some he most certainly did not get along with. Chief amongst them were Mortarian and his Death Guard. Mortarian distrusted all things warp related and would often openly speak out against the Librarius, seeing it as nothing but foul sorcery. Mortarian would later be amongst those who pressured the Emperor into calling the Council of Nikia. Lemon Russ and his Space Wolves were also amongst the people the Khan had no wish to get close to, mostly because he didn't want his legion to be seen as savages, an image the Vulcar Fenbroker seemed to embrace. The White Scars constantly strove to achieve the most noble of human pursuits, seriously, they went in for poetry and calligraphy. In addition, the comparison added soul to the wound of the V Legion's entrenched estrangement from the Imperium, suggesting how little effort others took to understand the Chagorians. Though the White Scars were not executioners like the Space Wolves or World Eaters like Angren's Berserk Zai Legion or perfect astarts like Fulgrim's Emperor's Children. They simply were what they were. They never demanded respect from anyone, 
and if the other legions knew nothing of them, then that was their loss, because the white scars knew about them. The V legion was faster, they moved faster and they killed faster. Secretly, Con and the white scars resented the outsiders disregard greatly, yet they refused to change their ways or legion culture. As a founder of the Librarius, the Khan opposed Mort, Russ, and Angren's plans to shut down the use of Sickers, given that he believed that all the Primarchs had something of the warp in them, he also thought they were deluded. And given that that furry hypocrite was involved with witchery under the banner of the spirit of his home planet, which is pretty much how Jagate saw the Storm Seers, and yet wouldn't admit that it was still warp fuckery all the way down, he was probably right. On a pettier note, the Khan didn't have much time for Fulgrim's vanity, thinking he was too attached to his beautiful clothes. He also rather disliked the pretentious barbs that Fulgrim would, knowingly or otherwise, throw towards those he saw as less fabulous than himself, like the Khan. In one conversation he confidently stated that he could kick Fulgrim's ass in a fight simply because his brother boasted about his prowess, whereas Jagate was an unknown quantity to almost all his brothers. Fulgrim staked everything on being seen as perfect, the Khan also found the ideal of Fulgrim and his legion insisting they were perfect to be insulting. After all if you were perfect you can't improve anymore. The Khan sought to achieve it no matter who did or didn't notice. Some would say this also applied to the Khan's fashion sense between the furs, silks, dragon helmet and that mustache he was as fabulous as Fulgrim, without making any fuss about it. The Khan also took the piss out of Fulgrim in one of the sickest burns ever delivered in the 40k universe. Told by Fulgrim that the Pikaki Phoenician had heard that you, he did, strange things with his ships, the Khan snapped right back that he'd heard that Fulgrim did strange things with his warriors. During this little spat he also made an interesting comparison between Fulgrim and Sanguinius, the latter of whom he got on with quite well. He noted that both were resplendent beyond compare, but that Sanguinius looked natural in his splendor whereas Fulgrim looked a bit foppish, as if he was trying too hard. He also thought that while Sanguinius would be willing to cast aside his finery without a second thought, Fulgrim would rather die. The official line about the warp being benign also made things difficult with his dad. Jagate was big on truth, and hated the idea of building a civilization on a lie. As a result, they didn't keep in touch, to the point that the Imperium seemed to completely forget about the scars. This might have had something to do with the Khan's preference for fighting orcs and other Xenos. There was no need to convince them to buy into a truth he didn't believe, and he was free to hunt. The Emperor's return to Terra probably also sounded like building bigger walls to the Khan's ears. At one point in Scars he bluntly tells a human logistics officer that they have conflicting ideas about the fate of humanity. The Khan had the honor of fighting alongside Horus in the Alana Crusade and was present at the event that saw Horus promoted to Warmaster. The Emperor also stepped down as leader of the Crusade to return to Terra and work on a secret project, a webway gate that Magnus would later thoroughly destroy in an attempt to warn the Emperor of Horus's treachery. Just before the White Scars were sent on another campaign, a great Imperial Conclave was called upon the world of Nikia. This Grand Council, known to history as the Council of Nikia, was called by the Emperor of Mankind himself, and was intended to determine whether or not the use of psychic powers represented a boon or a grave danger to both mankind and the nascent Imperium of Man. The Khan had intended to attend and argue for the case of the Librarius alongside Magnus and Sanguinius, but Horus ordered the Khan to journey to the Chondak system to rid the system of an orc infestation. Weirdly, the Khan did not simply go to the council anyway, considering he had the right to do so even when ordered to do something else as the Emperor said they could come to debate and what the Emperor says goes. The Khan chose to obey Horus, a decision he would later come to regret, and chose to send a representative in his place instead, his chief storm seer Targute Yasujiri. Unfortunately Yasujiri struggled to speak convincingly in Gothic, and the Imperium apparently couldn't find a competent Chagorian translator. Which is weird since everyone present could probably speak every human language, and many alien, to ever exist anyway considering they are Primarchs and the Mithurficking Emperor himself. Not to mention that with his Astartes brain enhancements there is no reason for Chagorian white scars to not speak Gothic, read, to invoke the politically incorrect trope, 
Yasujiri was acting like an inscrutable oriental, too alien to the more homogenized culture of the Imperium of Man. This probably wasn't helpful in portraying Sikri as something other than alien and inscrutable. Comma the outcome of the Council of Nikia is well known. The Emperor disbanded the Librarius and banned all further use of warp related powers. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. The Heresy. Having operated mostly as an independent force for most of the Great Crusade, no one knew what the fuck the Khan and White Scars were up to. The traitors had no idea where he was or what he was doing, except the Alpha Legion, since information is their shtick. On the Loyalist side, Dawn suspected that since Jagate and Horus had been close friends, he could very well have sided with them. Equally, the Khan had no idea about the murder Kega Horus had thrown in the Eistvan system or anything that had happened afterwards. After the dusk had cleared up, the Legion received a series of conflicting messages. Both sides were making a grab for one of the last legions to pick a team. Jagate's immediate response was to side with Horus, but then the Alpha Legion turned up to confuse his plans. After considering how little info he had, he opted for the grimdark equivalent of fuck y'all, I do what I want, and set off to do some detective work. Cue an extended road trip to Prospero, where he found out that Lemon Russ had indeed defeated his best friend Magnus and burned the planet. The fragment of his soul left behind there wasn't too upset about it though, since he eventually realized he had it coming and told the Khan as much, but that Horus and company had indeed turned traitor. The ultimate scene to in trolling, none of it makes sense, and yet all of it is true. Then Mortarian turned up, trying to recruit the Khan to the heresy. After kicking the sickers out of the loyalist legions, Mortarian found himself surrounded by them among the traitors and now sought the Khan as an ally in getting rid of them there. The Khan told the Death Lord he was an idiot and, in an epic duel, kicked the crap out of him for just assuming that his legion would side with Horus, well, that and the betrayal and murdering, and pointing out Mortarian's own hypocrisy and siding with the traitors, despite taking some serious punishment himself. Then he put down the warrior lodges among the scars that had been fomenting pro-Horus sentiment before finally getting his shit together and heading home to Terra. The traitorous Noyan Khan was impaled on a power sword by Jagate in a fit of rage, while the lower ranking marines were given the chance to redeem themselves or willingly face death for not reneging on a warp sworn vow. We know now that a few of them went off with some iron hands and treated Horus Aximan to a Chagorian facelift while several others were employed in an attack against Mortarian. Senior figures in the Legion noted that the high percentage of Terrans and the rebelling part of the Legion meant that the Chagorian part would become more insular and ingrained in their traditional views, which is kind of what happened 10,000 years later on. Comma the contrast to what happened with the Fallen Dark Angels is interesting, as both Terran and indigenous elements both, in their own distinctive ways, contributed both in rather spectacular measure to the growth of heresy in that loyalist regiment. Failure of both groups to integrate didn't help, but was less so in the way of being the direct problem in and of itself. In the intervening years, the White Scars, and the guerrilla tactics Sajar Mazen units, played merry havoc on the traitor advance, being the only full strength, roughly, legion fighting against the forces of the five main traitor legions and delaying the advance to Terra for several years. However, the Scars couldn't last forever in a war of attrition and Horus's forces started to box them in. The Khan reluctantly called all elements of the Legion together, after launching numerous feints, and made a push to the one glimmer of hope they had left. The mysterious abandoned Dark Glass project hinted at by captured members of the Navigators. Unbeknownst to the rest of the Imperium, the Emperor hadn't staked everything on the nascent Terran entrance into the webway, Dark Glass was a backup entrance to the Galactic Webway Network. After beating a retreat from the Emperor's children and Death Guard, 
during which Khan strangled and then tore the heart out of a keeper of secrets, the white scars finally arrived at Terra only to be greeted by Lemon Russ, who was still pissy that the scars hadn't taken his side immediately several books ago. The Khan's response was to throw down his broken sword, recently recovered from the insides of the aforementioned Keeper of Secrets, and bluntly tell the Wolf King that after the journey his legion had endured, nothing would keep them from the Thranu world and his father. Russ broke face for a bit and applauded the Khan for his perseverance in the face of utter ruin. Thus the Scars finally took their stage on the walls of the Imperial Palace, while Russ decided to shag off Emperor Knows Where and get his own legion killed like a moron. The Siege of Terror. During the siege of the Imperial Palace by the traitorous forces of chaos, Jagate served on the Imperial War Council, generally serving as a counterpoint to Rogaldorn by advocating more proactive moves in contrast to his brother's game plan of fortify, until the Ultra Smurfs and totally loyal lions showed up. He led a few sorties, some against Dawn's express orders, though he also got so annoyed by two high-ranking officers bemoaning their hopeless situation that he had them expelled from the council, which Dawn believed to be a regrettably unnecessary waste. However, after Beta Garmin and the early battles of the siege, he realized that they would need to recapture Lion's Gate spaceport to give the reinforcements a place to dock. So with the help of their aging logistics officer and mortal foil Alara Valian, he mustered every tank they could and led a charge against the Death Guard at the major spaceport. According to earlier sources, it is said that the Khan was leading his warriors from the top of a land raider, a sight which became a tale that has been told in all ever since, across 10 millennia. Coincidentally, he was apparently known to overturn land raiders with his bare hands during the battles of the heresy. Makes you wonder what Ferris and Vulcan could flip, if they were so inclined. This battle was immortalized by murals in the inner palace of the Holy Khan, would you say he is the bogged Khan? Ha. Ha. White Scar's humor is an acquired taste. Comma battling at the Lion's Gate spaceboat, against something huge, winged and wielding a scythe. No, not those chumps. Sure enough, Jagate had his rematch against Almorty in a titanic struggle. And much like when Roger Bajilasut had to fight stupid sexy snack boy, it went about as well as you could expect, despite his best efforts. Mortarian's demonically enhanced strength nearly killed Jagate, wrecking his armor, limbs, and face. But the Kagan still had an ace up his sleeve, the power of sick burns. Even on the verge of death, he was able to mock and needle the pustulant piss and himself to the point that Mortarian grew enraged and careless. Some of his noteworthy zingers were that he should have fought the Legion Master Typhon instead, and that while Mortarian gave in to the ruinous powers, he stayed true and my endurance is superior. Yes, you heard right. The hit and run Primarch told the War of Attrition Primarch that he was tougher. This bought him the opening he needed to get into a position, namely, along the edge of silence, to behead Mortarian, banishing him into the warp, though he was on death's doorstep as a result. This disoriented the Death Guard and sent the White Scars into a berserker barrage that let them push out the traitors and retake the Lion's Gate spaceport. The now comatose Jagate was then carried out on a Lemon Russ, no, not that guy. Ilya, sensing life still within him, had him loaded on a Thunderhawk and sent to Malkada for healing. Post Heresy. After the Heresy, Khan went on a crusade to rescue Imperial warriors captured by the Dark Elder directing the campaign at the head of his new successor chapters. Surprisingly, despite the whole wildly independent shtick, Jagate took Gilliman's reforms pretty well. At least from an organizational standpoint. Turns out, the White Scars already ran their legion like they were modern chapters, spread out as semi-independent groups which ran things the way they felt was best, the Codex just made it official. Tactically and culturally, of course, the Scars still did whatever they wanted, fusing the Librarius and Chaplancy, Stormseers are their main recruiters, minimal presence of Dreadnoughts or Devastator squad heavy support, and of course, all the bikes. All he asked of his successors after the split was that they joined him to kick Xeno's ass out of their sector, which any SPEHSS marine worth their salt is always up for. During one battle, it was reported that Khan finally got bored with his old life and decided to start a Dark Elder harem was sucked into a webway gate, 
with no sign of him discovered since then. The White Scars believe that he's still alive within the webway somewhere, and given the weird effects the webway has on time, this is likely the case. And now that we have one two loyalist Primarchs back in action already, another in stasis busy sleeping, and yet another who is indisposed but can't die, just like daddy, it's probable that the Khan might return as well somewhere down the line. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.